world leaders, CEOs, and business leaders arrive in San Francisco for the 2023 APEC Economic Leaders Week. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. Welcome to this special edition of The Heat. Leaders from 21 economies are here in San Francisco this week for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting. Talks will include some of the world's biggest challenges, including climate change, trade competition, equitable growth, and new technologies like artificial intelligence. And a critical meeting is expected to take place between Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Joe Biden on Wednesday. For more on APEC's top priorities, I spoke with Carlos Kuriyama, the director of the APEC Policy Support Unit. Carlos, thanks so much for joining us. This APEC leaders meeting is taking place at a very crucial time for the world's economy. There is a general global slowdown right now. How has that slowdown impacted member economies? Thanks for having me. Uh, well, uh, APEC this year is expected to grow around 3.3%. This is higher than what we experienced last year as your growth was around 2.8%. So we are, I would say, recovering from the pandemic. I think the world is past, but we still see that there are some downside risks that could affect the economy in the years to come. So we are having issues with inflation, higher debt levels. We are having issues with trade protectionism, uh, geoeconomic fragmentation, geopolitical issues, and weather issues as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also some upside opportunities that we have in a way that there's an increasing uh, uh, consumption. There's also a, a boost from tourism. And, and also there's some targeted fiscal support that I think is helping the, the economies. So I think the economies are coping better, let's say, than previous years. You say increased consumption, but are you also mm -hmm. seeing reduced external demand? Uh, well, it's uh, this year trade has slowed down, and basically the growth rate is going to be very, very little, close to nil. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is because I mean growth has been uh, economic growth has been quite uh, uneven; uh, it's been unstable. But we are expecting some more stable rates. So that will also help with external demand, with trade. You mentioned COVID-19. Of course, we're still experiencing yeah. the uh, after effects of that. In fact, you have written, and this is especially the impacts on developing countries, you've said that the poorest are getting worse off, the richest are getting better off. Um, are we seeing the inequality gap actually widening now? It widened uh, a bit during the pandemic, so the top then uh, riches got richer and the, the, the bottom 50%, I mean, they, they got poorer. And I, I can give you an example. For example, in, in Peru, where I come from, uh, during the pandemic, uh, well, uh, students had to study remotely. But what was the problem? Many of them didn't have access to smartphones, laptops, mm -hmm. or tablets. And so I understand that about 100,000 students had to stop their education for two years because of the lockdowns and social distancing measures. They couldn't go back to school. So that shows there's a gap because the poorest cannot access to internet and to those devices, but the riches, they, they, they do have. So we will, we will see this gap. You mentioned a whole range of factors that uh, are affecting uh, world growth. Uh, economies. You mentioned the role that extreme weather is playing uh, right now. Um, I mean, take something like the F El Nino. How does that affect growth? It's affecting agricultural production, fishing production, and that has a, an effect on prices, so higher prices. We are starting to see that, for example, in the price of some cereals, in the case of rice, corn, sorghum. Uh, and it's not just this weather factor but also there has been a disruption in the fertilizer supply chain that is affecting this. Now, um, you mentioned inflation a moment ago, and of course inflation is on the rise in many yeah. member economies. How is that affecting? 
well, affects in many ways. I think it's those in more vulnerable conditions that are feeling the effect of inflation. Also, the production cost increases. And at the end, the price is it's transmitted to consumers. And inflation also, on the other hand, uh, uh, motivates uh, monetary authorities to increase interest rates. So at the end, the cost of credit is more expensive, uh, and that could slow down economic activity. Now, on the plus side, uh, the IMF has just revised China's economic growth rate uh, from 5% to 5.4%. That's for 2023-2024. Uh, How will China's increased growth be uh, seen as a driver of global economic growth? It's positive for, for the whole world, not just for the region, mm -hmm. in a way that China is a very important economic actor, right? It's the second largest economy. A, a lot of uh, economies all over the world have China as a main trade partner. China is also a, an important source of foreign direct investment as well. So if China uh, recovers, I mean, it does, China does better, it's better for the rest as well. Uh, on the sidelines of this uh, meeting, there will be a meeting between uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, with the, his American counterpart, Joe Biden. Um, they will be meeting uh, after about a year. The last time they met was on the sidelines of the G20, which took place in Bali. That was in November last year. Uh, what are your hopes for that? I think it's very important. I think it's important to keep the dialogue between the two parties. And I would say, I mean, it's in the best interest of not just U.S. China, but the whole world, that both parties have a very good relations. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win situation. And I think it's a good opportunity to de-risk and find ways to work together. Um, looking at that more specifically, you know, we've just seen what the trade tariffs, the trade war, as it's sometimes called, has done uh, between the United States and China. Would you like to see some progress on that? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's important, you know, to avoid implementation of trade protectionist measures that would help. But also what I would like to highlight is that the a bilateral trade between U.S. and China mm -hmm. is at the highest historical level ever. So despite some political rhetoric that we hear right. from the economic perspective, things are going well in a way that trade has increased, I mean, to these mm -hmm. historical highest levels. Right. And looking at this bilateral meeting, I mean, yeah. from, from a political point of view, uh, do you think it will bring some sense of stability? to what we have seen over the past it, It's years. very important. So, yeah. I mean, we have a lot of uh, issues, right, at a global level. We need cooperation. So we have global problems, and we need global solutions. Mm -hmm. And for that, it's important that the two main uh, partners, economies in the world, sit down and work together. That could help a lot. You mentioned de-risking. Um, there's been quite a debate going on. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it involves, you know, definitions of things, de-risking, decoupling, um, putting labels on things, etc. The United States now says that it's not talking about decoupling, it's talking about de-risking. How do you see that? Well, I think uh, firms in general have been following different strategies in recent times. In the past, they were following a just-in-time approach in, way in which they got parts and components from all over the world, right. from the cheapest sources or the most efficient sources. But now they are following a just-in-case approach in which they are sourcing from, let's say, fewer partners, probably partners that are closer, mm -hmm. uh, and they are building redundancies just in case. Mm -hmm. So that is creating some sort of geo-economic mm -hmm. shifting. But, but it's also a lot related to economic forces. For example, right, the, 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 the cost of living, the production yeah. cost in China now is not the same production cost that it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so firms are looking where we can still keep our competitive advantages. Yeah. And that happens all over the world. Interesting yeah. distinction you make there. So it's gone from just in time to just in case. Yeah. Uh, and what's the significance of that? The significance is that there's going to be some, some, some shifts, changes in trade flows, investment flows as well. Yeah. So it's new strategies. 
The Chinese Vice President Han Zheng, he recently said that, I'm quoting him here, he said, decoupling, severing industrial and supply chains, and so-called de-risking will all only divide the global economy into many isolated islands. What can be done to avoid that? We need to keep supply lane open. We need to keep a very, very, very smooth supply chain. So in that way, I mean, we can continue doing business, and that's good for everyone. Where do you see the greatest potential for economic growth right now? I mean, it's a, a potentials. A definitely, trade could be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So you see, I mean, there has been some take on, uh, uptick on protectionist measures. If we remove all of that, I, I think that could help to boost, boost, boost growth. There, ha there, there has been potential in also after the pandemic, right? The reopening of the of the borders. There's more and more activity. Tourism, for example, is one of the sectors that has been recovering. Some domestic services as well that had some limitations because of the pandemic. So I, I, I try to be optimistic, and I, I hope that all these discussions in APEC help us to create a proper atmosphere to to prosper. How big a challenge would it be to bring down those protectionist barriers? You know, China's always been a champion of globalization, of multilateralism. It's not shared by the whole world. <laughs> what we need to do is to continue discussing things, to sit together. So the positive thing now here in APEC is that we have 21 members with different point, point of views, but they are all sitting in the same room. So it's important to keep those speaking terms. So the APEC meetings will get underway in just uh, the next few days. What are your expectations? Well, I hope some commitments, for example, on refraining from implementing new trade restrictive measures, also some commitments in the issue of sustainability. That's a very important topic now. So commitments, for example, on uh, changing the, the energy mix in the electricity sector towards more renewables, also commitments on uh, phasing out uh, fossil inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, uh, among other things. Are you seeing um, a movement towards sustainable energy? Because you know, in some parts of the world, it's actually they're taking two steps back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think now everyone is seeing that this is a uh, sustainability is very important. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think is going to stay in all these discussions in, in all these groups. Uh, we can see what is the negative effect, you know, yeah. of climate change. Production is falling, but also a lot of destruction of infrastructure, loss of human lives, and so there are real concerns. In APEC, we uh, conducted a study, and we noticed that on average, $111 billion are lost because of weather-related events. So. It's a lot of money resources that could be otherwise used in other activities, right? That could help us to uh, develop, help us to improve our health sector, education, mm -hmm. infrastructure, um, among other things. There is a feeling in some quarters that growth, economic growth, and sustainability are not compatible. They are. They are. I, 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 I think the, uh, it's, it's possible to to, to combine both, right? Now with new technologies, it, it, it's possible. Carlos Carriama, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. China and Australia recently opened a new chapter on bilateral relations. Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted the Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, during a recent four-day state visit in Beijing. Albanese is the first Australian leader to visit China in seven years. The two countries pledged to strengthen economic and trade exchanges. Craig Emerson is a member of the Australian delegation, the former Australian Trade Minister and Director of the Australian APEC Study Centre at RMIT University. I spoke with Emerson about Australia-China relations and his expectations for APEC. Dr. Emerson, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, there have been tensions in the relationship between China and Australia. Uh, in the past, but we've just had the Australian Prime Minister. He's wrapped up a visit to Beijing. So how would you characterize where this relationship is heading right now? Improving, improving all the time. So 
uh, the various tariffs have been substantially removed now. And you can tell from the warmth of the welcome in China for our Prime Minister Albanese that uh, there's a genuine effort on the part of the Chinese to re-engage more constructively than has been the case up until about uh, early 2022. So uh, things are definitely improving. Um, we will always have some differences. I, I can't imagine any country that has no differences with another country, but those re differences are being held in a respectful way. Uh, so I see a very positive future between Australia and China and a new era of complementarity between our economies that should make for increased trade and investment between the two countries. Right, so you say a positive future. Where do you see the greatest potential for an improvement in relations? Well, in terms of trade, I think it's going to be the energy transition. It was clear when I was in China leading the Australian delegation to the high-level dialogue that um, this was really the, the issue on people's minds as China seeks to decarbonise. So there's going to be a new era of investment in China, which is about um, renewable energy and obviously the production of electric vehicles, which will require all sorts of um, minerals, uh, many of which Australia has in abundance. So, you know, we've had we had a period which is ongoing of selling iron ore uh, to China, um, and that was basically. Uh, assisting with its industrialisation, but now we have a new era of industrial development which is based on renewable energy and decarbonisation. Australia has an aspiration to be a renewable energy superpower. So again, uh, here we find ourselves in a relationship uh, of great complementarity between our two economies and with the improved uh, diplomatic relations that probably will accelerate now. Right. You were involved in those high-level uh, dialogue talks with China. You were the head of the Australian delegation to those talks. You are a former trade minister. You travelled to Beijing in September. What was your impression? What did you take away from those talks? Well, we had a lot of um, different talks. Uh, I did meet with um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, uh, and, but with our counterparts also in the high-level uh, delegation. And it was clear to me uh, that the Chinese side was seeking to um, re-engage with Australia, um, to put past differences behind us to the extent that we possibly could and um, resume a relationship that had been very good up until a few years um, leading into 2022. And so that was clear from just about every speaker that I uh, spoke with or we engaged with at the high-level dialogue and also in the meeting that uh, I had with Wang Yi. Now, uh, China has, uh, looking at the specifics uh, of improving trade, China has dropped anti-dumping tariffs and anti-subsidy tariffs on Australian barley that was in August. There are still tariffs on wine, on lobster and on meat products that Australia showcased at the China International Import Expo in Shanghai. Um, where do efforts stand on uh, those tariffs, getting those tariffs dropped? Well, on wine, um, the Chinese side has initiated a review which takes a few months, and this is quite standard as an approach that they take to reconsidering tariffs. Uh, so I think the Australian side is pretty optimistic about that. And I think there's room for optimism about uh, lobster as well. And on beef, um, the story there is that uh, beef, Australian beef is going into China, but some uh, meat processing facilities uh, in answering a question during COVID whether their workers had COVID said, yes, they did. And that led to a quarantine issue, uh, but we're way beyond COVID in Australia now. So again, there are very good prospects for those restrictions, which weren't so much tariffs as, as a health issue or quarantine issue. Uh, there's good prospects for those restrictions being lifted. And looking more broadly uh, at China's role in the region, China's been described as the economic anchor of the Asia-Pacific. How do you see China's contribution not just to the region, but to global economic growth? But China's one of the two biggest economies on Earth. and. Um, not unexpectedly, its growth rate has fallen 
you know, from the sort of, there were times where it was growing at 10 to 12 percent per annum. Uh, now it's about 4 percent, but in the context of world economic growth, that's still one of the fastest growth rates in the world. And when one of the two biggest economies on earth is growing at 4 percent, you can see the, the opportunities uh, that that generates in terms of trade and investment. So China will continue to be a major or really the major economic player in our own region in the Asian, East Asian and Asia Pacific region. And of course, the United States will play an important role too. But, you know, the China story um, really started way back in 1984 with uh, the, the opening that had been foreshadowed by Deng Xiaoping. And that journey is still now well underway, but it will, its, its economy will change. Um, it'll be less uh, production of uh, using heavily polluting um, uh, technologies of um, iron and steel and so on, and more into the renewable energy area. So it's an exciting new area and China can play a role in you know, almost leading the energy transition. Uh, it already has a renewable energy um, base, which is, I think, arguably, definitely the biggest in the region, perhaps in the world. Uh, so there are enormous opportunities there. And it's good for humanity that we are decarbonising and that a country like China is playing such an active role in that. Right. Now, the APEC meetings are underway in the United States in the city of San Francisco. 21 economies represented here. Uh, at those uh, talks. Uh, the APEC theme for this year is creating a resilient and sustainable future for all. And as you pointed out a moment ago, the Australian Prime Minister is uh, a firm advocate uh, in the fight for uh, against climate change, I should say. He's pledged to cut emissions and, as you pointed out, become a renewable energy powerhouse. Can you give us some idea of where Australia is right now in, uh, in those efforts? Uh, well, it has very ambitious uh, renewable energy goals, and uh, that transition is well underway now. Um, every uh, month, there's more renewable energy capacity being installed in Australia. No new coal-fired power stations have been built since 2007, and I could confidently predict that no new coal-fired power stations will be built in Australia. So the ones that are there, uh, think of 2007 to 2023, uh, even the most uh, modern of them is starting to age, and there are others that are approaching 40 years. So that they will be retired, and uh, they need to be replaced, and they'll be replaced by renewable energy and with permanent capacity um, supplied by uh, probably gas, uh, at least in the short term. But it is a really profound energy transition. And, Yet again, Australia finds itself with an abundance of uh, renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind. We just need to get that firming capacity right. And another con contributor to that will be pumped hydro. Uh, and there's a number of projects on the drawing board there. So we do look forward to a clean energy future. The Chinese President Xi Jinping, he will be holding talks, having a meeting with his American counterpart, Joe Biden. Um, what would you like to hear come out of that exchange? An easing of tensions between the two great powers. Um, they, they're superpowers themselves, um, and there's a rivalry, we know that, between the two. Uh, my experience and the experience of most people who have been in, engaged in international diplomacy is that face-to-face uh, -face talks are absolutely the best. Uh, I don't know what it is about human nature, but if uh, two leaders are speaking face to face, even if it's say a, a, a quite a formal meeting, uh, that is much better than um, you know diplomacy, including megaphone diplomacy, if you like. Uh, so I'm I'm very hopeful about uh, a, a resetting of the relationship between the United States and China. It won't go to uh, you know when I'm not naive about it. It won't solve all problems by any means but it'll do um, some or a lot of good and no harm. Easing of tensions, yes, but if we look uh, more specifically at some of the economic issues that are going to be discussed here by those uh, 21 member economies uh, here in San Francisco, um, what do you believe are the priorities for those talks here? 
Well, Australia's always, well, not always, sorry, I'll correct that, long been an advocate of free and open trade. Uh, we've done this through the World Trade Organization. We've done it through the establishment of APEC, which was an initiative of Prime Minister Bob Hawke, and indeed uh, creating um, or transforming APEC into a leadership forum was an initiative of, again, Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating. And the whole reason that behind that was economic integration, that countries get on so much better if they're integrated with each other rather than in some sort of head-to-head -head competition. That is the mutual gains from trade. And so I hope that that tradition works. We're probably uh, continues. We're probably not going through the best um, patch at the moment because there are lots of trade restrictions being put in place around the world. So I hope that the talks here at APEC will uh, remind leaders that uh, the way for the future, uh, for a peaceful and prosper prosperous future, is for free and open trade. Dr. Emerson, uh, the world is beset by so many issues right now. And if you look at some of the geopolitical issues that, uh, is, that are preoccupying leaders right now, we have the conflict in Ukraine, and of course, there's war in the Middle East right now. Uh, I mean, do you think with all these issues going on that economic growth, the fight against climate change, you know, are those things getting the attention that they deserve? Uh, well, it's, it, you know, it's tragic what's happening both in Ukraine and um, in Israel and Gaza. Uh, but uh, as much attention is being paid to that and should be paid to it to seek a peaceful resolution in both cases, uh, it doesn't mean that everything else is off the agenda. So I, I do think that um, with meetings such as the APEC meeting, uh, just think of 21 leaders uh, from around the, you know, the Asia-Pacific region getting together uh, in a room. I had the honour of representing Australia in 2012 at the APEC leaders meeting at Vladivostok uh, when Julia Gillard's um, father sadly died and he had to go and she had to return to Australia. And there's just no substitute for people sitting around and can I just add that some of the most useful discussions occur during coffee breaks uh, where people are just, you know, you just walk up to some, a leader from another country and have a chat. So there are the very formal uh, meetings that occur on the sidelines of APEC, but lots of uh, informal discussions also occur. What, that is, ones that are not actually scheduled, but you're just um, all in the same room and have a chat with each other. Dr. Craig Emerson, thank you for joining us, sir. And that's it for this special edition of The Heat from San Francisco. Join us throughout the week as we bring you more in-depth coverage of the APEC meetings. I'm Arnand Naidu. Thanks for watching. From sustainability and digitalization to trade, health, and energy security, 21 major Asian Pacific economies gather to address the most pressing global challenges and to create a future of sustainable economic growth. Join CGTN for our coverage of APEC 2023.